Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Splendid show to see so many eager faces, both here in the room and we have a number of people uh, participating on Zoom. So uh, it's quite a nice crowd. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Paul Lakeland. I direct our University Center for Catholic Studies. And this is the third of three sessions this semester in which we've been looking at different aspects of the question, how should Catholic universities be um, faithful to their mission in connection with issue X, issue Y, and so on. So last time we met here, uh, three weeks ago, I think, we looked at the question, how do we serve the underserved? So we're looking at what do Catholic institutions in general do? What's their record? How faithful are they to the ideals that they uh, claim to have? And second issue is to bring it a little closer to home and ask, well, how are we doing relative to what everyone else is doing and relative to what our mission is? And then third, how can we do better? This time, we are looking at the question of racial justice and a particular issue in the whole range of things we could talk about connected to racial justice, namely the case for reparations. But within that framework, we've got really these three issues going. How do Catholic institutions, what's the report card on Catholic institutions around the country? How is Fairfield doing relative to them, relative to its own uh, stated principles? And what could we do better? So to help us address these issues, we have three distinguished members of the university community. To my, and I'm going to let each of them say a little bit about who they are individually as they do their, uh, make their remarks. But they are, to my, to my immediate right, so t you're looking to my left, Yolema um, Felikan from Student Affairs, Tushi Patel, a senior here at the university, and Dr. Shannon King from the History Department. So each of them, in turn, will talk for a few minutes. Then we would love to have questions and comments from this group and from the people online. And Perhaps they'll interact with one another a bit, and we will be wrapping everything up around 5 o'clock, or if we all get really excited, a few minutes after that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm going to step away and leave it to them uh, in a moment, but I just want to say one thing for the benefit of people watching online. If you're watching online and you wish to ask a question, you've probably figured this out by now, but in case this is the first time, you can type a question into the Q&A uh, by hitting the Q&A button on your screen and type in the question, and I will be monitoring the questions on my iPad, and I will pass them along to the, to the panel here at the end of their presentations. So if you, if you people online have any questions, that's how you ask them. And the great benefit there is you can ask it the moment it comes into your head. The good people in front of me here can think of a question and then forget it. Don't do that. Okay, so uh, so without more ado, I am going to step aside and I am going to give the floor to Yolema Felican. Over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Paul. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, as Paul said, my name is Yolema Felican. I'm the Associate Director of Student Diversity and Multicultural Affairs. Uh, I've been at the university, um, back at the university for about four years. I'm an alumna of the university, um, so I'm just happy to be back and happy to engage with you all and have a conversation. Um, so to start off, as, as Paul mentioned, what we'll be discussing today, I'm um, just wanting to talk about what Catholic universities um, are, are doing just, you know, all across the world um, to shoulder the responsibility um, of becoming anti-racist, right? 
Um, and with that question, you know, it, it, po it prompts the question of what is anti-racist, right? So before we even get into what we're doing, um, what is it? So anti-racist is the opposition of racism, but not only just opposing racism and knowing that racism, um, you know, is wrong or bad or whatever the case may be, but to actively um, fight against racism um, and also to dismantle systems that are in place that contribute and or um, are explicitly racist. Um, with that said, there's a lot of different um, Catholic uh, universities um, all across the world that are doing different things. But as a collective, even before getting into the specifics, um, one of the things when doing this work is being vulnerable, being empathetic and compassionate when it comes to working with underserved populations to really understand um, the needs of, of um, underserved populations. Um, some of the things that universities, um, Catholic universities are doing um, that I've noticed is one of the things they're having a explicit um, anti-racist statement. So it is holding the uh, university accountable when we talk about what is it that you're doing, what is it that you're committing to. It's making a commitment and it's standing in solidarity explicitly. Um, and another piece is also doing what you say that you're going to do in this commitment and not only having it, you know, on your website. But again, it shows externally everyone who would look at the website, um, who would learn about the institution, that this is the values and the belief system of the university. Um, collaborating just as a university, when that comes to um, inclusive excellence centers, when it comes to diversity centers, um, really leaning on, on professionals um, to help do the work and understand that it takes a, a commitment of everyone to, to really become anti-racist. Um, again, accountability is very, very important. Understanding that we don't know everything, that they don't know all that there is to know, but again, leaning on external factors, leaning on um, campus partners to, to really collectively do the work. Um, programs and initiatives are really important, right? So part of it, part of that, that anti-racist um, statement is a start, right? It's saying what we're committed to doing, uh, what we plan on doing, but then the programs and initiatives is doing the work. It's those action steps. Um, collectively, so that's just some of the some of the points that Catholic universities are doing um, across the world. But I did want to highlight and just point out um, a few different Catholic universities and kind of just name them. One of the ones, um, which is actually the largest uh, Catholic institution in the nation, which is DePaul University, um, having a, a very visible anti-racist statement. So if you were to go on um, the website to see, you know, the morals and the values of the institution, you would be able to see this information. Um, another one that I just wanted to, oh, and I'm going to backtrack because this is a really important one, um, institutionalized training when it comes to diversity and equity um, and inclusion work, um, as well as promoting anti-racist work. Because a lot of times when it comes to anti-racism, sometimes folks don't know where to start. It's like you want to fight the good fight, but how? And if institutions don't allow this opportunity for you to be an ally and to fight this good fight, um, sometimes, you know, um, folks will remain stagnant or not know where to turn. But it, it's the mission and, and the, the obligation, essentially, um, of Catholic institutions to be able to provide this for its larger campus community um, to make sure that we are standing in solidarity and actually um, fighting towards um, to be anti-racist. So I did want to um, look at Xavier, um, which talks about becoming an anti-racist university, and I just wanted to read off their anti-racist um, statement. Xavier recognizes that the lived experiences of individuals who are black, indigenous, persons of color, have been marked by racial biases, aggression, and other discriminatory practices. In alignment with our Jesuit values to walk as companions with the marginalized, oppressed, and vulnerable, and to work for justice, we have pledged to fight against all manifestations of racism and inequity at Xavier. Our commitment outlined by the university's anti-racist action plan is transformational and touches every area at Xavier, including academics, student life, and employee relations. This website will serve as a resource and communication hub for an up-to-date information as we enhance our efforts to promote racial justice, equity, and inclusion at Xavier and work towards authentic change. And even with the ending, when we talk about being authentic, 
authenticity also goes hand in hand when it comes to vulnerability. When we're talking about walking with the marginalized or um, you know serving the underserved populations. Um, and with that, just some of the things that I wanted to highlight um, with offices. They have an Office of Institutional Diversity, Center for Diversity and, Inclu and Inclusion, um, President's Diversity and Inclusion Action and Advisory Council. But then there's just tons of different programs that promote um, anti-racist work. And I just want to highlight just a few of them, such as there's actually an ally um, program, an anti-racist ally program that they have. Um, aspiring anti-racist allies. So it's it's that point of don't know where to start, but you're able to be in a room of like-minded individuals to do this work. Um, for Catholics, there's a commitment and an obligation to be anti-racist. So with that said, I'm going to pass it over to Suchi. Thank you, Yulima. I am Tushi Patel, a senior behavioral neuroscience and international studies double major with minors in peace and justice studies and humanitarian action it is quite a mouthful, so I always regret when someone asks me what my majors are. Um, in regards to what Ulema just said, as well, like accountability and reconciliation, that does require acceptance. And so to answer the question of what are we doing well and what could we do better, I think it ties into what you just said and taking accountability for what has happened on this campus. Um, in terms of what we do well on this campus, it was a little hard to come up with answers for that, I will say. It's taken me a week to reflect upon it and to really, when I first was asked that, I was completely absent-minded about what we do well. But I think in recent, in past weeks, it's solidarity. What we do well is that we do show up for one another. Um, the support of professors, of faculty, of students in the protest, in the weeks that were following with dialogues, that is something that we have grown in. I won't, I will say I've been here for four years and that hasn't always been very visible or very evident. We've been progressing in that and there's been growth in that and I think that needs to continue and that ties into what we could still do better is having that vulnerable conversation, recognizing that not all of us will ever have an answer. So I don't have a full concrete answer as I sit up here on what we have done well or what we could do better because I'm still learning. Um, and it's being able to admit that. It's being able to admit that we make mistakes. It's being able to admit that we don't always know, but having that dialogue with others. It's engaging those conversations and it's calling people in. Um, a great mentor of mine, and I think you can also attest to that, Ophelia Rowallen, she used to have this phrase, instead of calling people out, she would say, call people in. Instead of attacking people on their opinions and their viewpoints, call them into a conversation, call them in with your own vulnerability. Um, and I think also in regards to representation, I do believe we are doing well when it comes to trying out programs and initiatives, but that also requires proper representation. When it comes to boards, the majority of our board are white men. That doesn't accurately represent the world in itself, but it does accurately represent the majority of our population on campus. And if we want to have that change and we want better representation, it means having those spaces within boards, within trustees, and within offices and committees where that representation doesn't does exist. Not just calling them in, not just inviting them to have a conversation or share their own story, but genuinely having that space for them and including them with actual action, not just because we need to fill a quota or have a number. And I think the other thing is, and this is often met with a lot of anger, I've expressed it as well, and I've had friends that have also expressed it, but falsely using advertisement to convey proper representation on this campus is wrong, and I think we also have to address that, is having marketing properly represent the campus to falsify marketing with, here's a diverse community, that doesn't always stay true. Um, and also seeing it as humans. I think when we try to implement initiatives, when we try to implement change, we forget that it's not just statistics. It's actual human experiences, it's actual human trauma. Um, and yeah, I'll pass it over to Dr. King. Good late afternoon, my name is Shannon King. Associate Professor of History and Director of Black Studies. Um, I've been here since fall of 2019, although I feel like I'm still new to the institution. 
because of COVID and we've all been um, covered up with our masks. So it's wonderful to see you all, some of you without your masks. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about reparations and perhaps it's um, the case of reparations. And so what I wanted to do was define it a little bit. And so a very basic definition of reparations would be to repair wrongdoings, right? Um, and, and a way to think about that is thinking about how might we define a wrongdoing. Um, and if we're talking about people of color, what are the groups in this country um, that have been um, mistreated in particular ways, historically and currently, right? So those are some basic ways of thinking about it in an abstract way. Um, of course, we could get much more historical, and that's what I wanted to do a little bit because that's my training. And so in the case of African Americans, we might think about the institution of slavery. Um, and so for just a little context for slavery, and, and this is something that I've learned through conversations with my nieces and nephews, students, friends, colleagues, et cetera, who um, have a sense of what slavery was but didn't necessarily know how long it lasted, when it began, what exactly was, was slavery, right? And so some of them have a sort of abstract idea about slavery as it was, race, it was a racist institution. So slavery was a racist institution, but it was also an economic institution, right? And it was also a political institution. So that's important to, to consider. Um, and so if we think of uh, an individual who was a slave for 10 years, Let's imagine that that individual um, does not have political or economic rights, um, was physically abused, and for 10 years worked um, without being paid. But if we combine that to millions of um, slaves, and if we think about how slavery began before the founding of this country, then, and, and it ended in 1865, then you know that's a really long time. So just to give you some numbers or dates, approximately, depending upon um, what state, but we could say that the institution of slavery in North America began around the 1640s, right? Um, and so obviously that's 100 plus years uh, before the founding of the United States. And then it lasted once uh, for another um, 100 years or so. So that's um, hundreds of years of unfreed labor um, that you know are clearly connected to African Americans and this country's wealth. We might also talk about um, how the United States um, not only did it have an inst the institution of slavery, but it also um, occupied different countries such as Haiti um, between 1915 uh, to 1934 and controlled its uh, finances for another. 20 years, that's another way of thinking about um, uh, reparations, for example, wrongdoing, violence, et cetera. Um, other, there are other programs that we could identify that whites had access to even after slavery or just before slavery ends in 1865, such as the Homestead Act in 1862 or the Southern Homestead Act in 1866 um, or the Federal Housing Administration's mortgage insured loans between 1934 and 1968. And so I'm just giving a sense of various ways that African Americans were either excluded or and or whites had access to resources from the federal, state, and local governments that African Americans didn't have access to. So that's one way of thinking about it. Other ways of thinking about reparations um, could be apologizing for slavery or apologizing for wrongdoing, right? Um, other approaches have been thinking about reparations through litigation. For example, 1921, the Tulsa riot. Um, Tulsa, the Tulsa black community was known as Black Wall Street, and, and African Americans there managed to build wealth, and though their homes were burned down, and they were killed, and they lost all their businesses. And you know, that's, an, uh, that's one approach. Um, so there are various ways of thinking about it. Now, so that's the sort of historical context. I do think, though, that reparations um, could be understood in different ways. It doesn't always have to be about money. It could be about different kinds of ways of engaging these questions in honest ways. Um, 
through programs, resources, et cetera, um, that I think are important um, to at least, at the very least, acknowledging some sense of wrongdoing, like what, what happened, why it happened when it happened, and how we implicated all of us, right? Um, and, and I think that plays out um, differently depending upon the place and time, right? So what reparations might look like at Georgetown University, some of you may know that um, one of the ways that Georgetown universities kept afloat in the 19th century was through selling of slaves and they sold the slaves and they were able to keep the university together. And so I think, do you recall, maybe in the last 10 or 15 years, they created a program where they provide an education for descendants of slaves um, in, in Washington, D.C., and in, in, in the Baltimore, Maryland era, for example. At Fairfield, that would look very different, right? Or the Bronx, New York, and Fordham University, that might look very different, right? And so I think a lot of that has to do with having productive conversations about these issues. It may not be African Americans, it could be Native Americans, right? It could be Asian Americans, for example, if we're talking about the West Coast, right? So there's various ways of thinking about um, how, and I forgot to press my timer, so I'm gonna stop there, but, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. But that's a little sense of, of, of the case of reparations um, and sort of how it may look different depending upon the place and time, et cetera, et cetera. So. Um, I actually just want to add, thank you both. Um, as we're talking about reparations in the, in the way of repairing, right, I want to get back to the question about what's Fairfield University doing um, and what we can do better. Uh, so some, some or things that we do well or, or what we're currently doing, I'll say. Um, is addressing, right? Like starting to bring in these conversations um, to the forefront, acknowledging, acknowledging that this is happening, um, that things are still happening in the world, addressing that, that racism still exists, right? A lot of people would like to um, think that racism doesn't exist because it's not overt, um, because they're not members of the Ku Klux Klan or, or that that's, you know, not still at the forefront, right? Um, but it's very much still happening in covert ways and to not, you know, um, deny that fact is one of the things that Fairfoot is doing in different departments um, and throughout the university. Um, so again, acknowledging, but things that we can do better because when we go back to what anti-racism is, when we go back to what we can be doing better is moving past the acknowledging stage and we have to move past just the addressing stage, but we have to move into the action stage. And we have to move into the action stage of addressing policies um, that contribute to racism potentially, right? Well, when you talk about anti-racism, we're talking about policies that contribute, policies that, cr that keep um, underrepresented folks oppressed and things of that nature, right? And one of the examples that I'll just be very you know, straightforward with because it, it just really um, had a shift in the climate at the university and made a lot of underrepresented and marginalized students feel unwelcomed and unsupported on campus, which is the removal of the Black Lives Matter flag. Now, it said that that went against policy. And though that may be true, it's a time where you have to rethink, well, what is that policy? And how is it making people feel? And, and how are we advancing the institution with the policies that we have in place? Because of course, policies are in place for a reason. We don't wanna go against certain policies necessarily, right? But sometimes it's imperative that we rethink these policies in order to become a truly anti-racist um, community and anti-racist institution. Um, in ways that we can continue to do that um, and move towards that route is having a chief diversity officer, um, is having um, institutionalized diversity trainings. When we come on campus, uh, we have to do um, a lot of different trainings in the very beginning of the year, whether that is students, faculty, staff, as a collective community, because we are saying that this is important. We want to do, you know, bystander trainings or suicide prevention trainings, and we want to do all these other trainings because they are so important. And we have to put at the forefront that diversity, equity, and inclusion, and becoming an anti-racist institution is equally important. To add to, add to that point, also, like, the programs and initiatives shouldn't just fall onto the onus of the SDMA office either. It should be every single office on campus that takes that part and takes that onus in creating that change too. Oh, well, thank you for, ooh, thank you for an initial uh, set of remarks. And we're gonna get you to talk to one another a bit more as we go along. Before we let you do that, let's see if anyone here 
uh, wants to respond to anything that any of the three have said or ask a little more information about it or challenge it. And while you are thinking about what you want to ask, Professor Merritt has a question. We need to use this for the people online. Thank you so much for your comments and for this panel in general. I think it's so important for us to have these conversations in general, but especially in light of what's been going on on campus these past few weeks. Um, I just have a, a general question um, about the difference of a discrimination statement versus or an anti-discrimination statement and an anti-racist statement. Um, and the, the importance of that distinction and how those two statements speak to two different realities um, and how faculty can uh, use the, the differentiation of those statements, but also the institution in general. Anyone want to take that? Just to, to make sure I understand the question, the difference between um, discrimination and, and racism, is that? No, 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 no. Like the, so right, like the current mission and identity and values of the university has certain comments about discrimination, but I think many of us would agree that that doesn't go so far as constituting an anti-racist statement. Um, so thinking about like the different uses of those statements and how um, members of the community can engage in um, I, I mean, I'm okay with starting and feel free to chime in, but I think um, how I would respond to that is that they go hand in hand in the sense because discrimination is a part or a contributor when it comes to racism. Um, so I, I would just, honestly, I would just say that they, they go hand in hand um, and have are like equally valuable or, or important when we're doing this work. So it, it's when we talk about discrimination, we talk about racism and anti-racism, and we have to address um, those discriminatory statements and things of that sort in order to move forward into being anti-racist and address those and, and work through those um, th those different things. So maybe it, it won't be an outright, or maybe it's not an outright anti-racist statement per se, um, but it's a it's a contributor, if that, if that sort of answers your question. And anyone feel free to mm -hmm. kind of chime in. Did you want to say something? Yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to say language does matter. And I would say that, as, as you said, like they go hand in hand. And it shouldn't be the absence of either within a statement. Um, I think having both within a statement would be more powerful and more useful, I guess, is not necessarily what I'm going for, but impactful as it calls it out. It calls it in. It, does, it doesn't just avoid saying it. I think... I think we're often afraid of saying anti-racism or racism, but we have to say it and we have to include it. Thank you for the question. So one way of thinking about it is that discrimination is the category and racism is the kind mm -hmm. or sexism is the kind, right? So if you're anti-racist, then that's targeting a, a particular issue as opposed to discrimination, which is broader. So that's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it, um, and this is how a, a historian or a political scientist or a sociologist might think about it, um, is that racism generally pertains to not just individuals, but institutions and groups, right? Whereas an individual can be discriminated against um, and the difference is, is that when a person of color is generally discriminated against, they're not only discriminated generally, right? Um, they're not only discriminated by the particular action, let's say, of an individual, but also the ways in which institutions support what that individual is doing, right? So the, the, the most prominent example could be how we talk about policing in this country some of us might think of it as a good or a bad apple approach, right? And we might focus on individuals, where another approach would be thinking about policing as police institutions and what they do as institutions beyond the individual action, right? Um, so that's what one way, and generally when folks are talking about 
um, an anti-racist approach, they're really talking about um, historic um, and current um, ways that institutions, policies, and practices, right? So it's all three institutions, policies, and practice produce a racist outcome, sometimes perpetuated by an individual, which might be, which is different from how um, a person might be discriminated against, but that, but that individual is not part of a group that has been um, the oppressed at the institution, practice, or policy level. Could we uh, just follow up a little bit on, on uh, Tushi's statement that words matter, right? So, you know, um, somehow uh, here we tend to try to use the blander words when we can, you know? So, of course, institutionally, we're against discrimination. We might even want to say we're not racist, but we don't want to say we're anti-racist. And So, with that kind of thought, I wanted to come back to to something that Yulema had said, you referred to uh, our um, commitment to inclusive excellence. We used to call it radical hospitality, and that didn't seem to ring the right bell, so we went to inclusive excellence. I just wonder if that, too, is a kind of weasel word to get around what it is that we should be seeking to be. I mean, could we be talking? Could we be using the language of solidarity better than inclusive excellence? It sounds lovely, but any thoughts on that? Anybody? Um, I think when it comes to inclusive excellence, I just think of um, really everyone thriving, you know, uniformly or, or together, right? So essentially, you know, in solidarity with. But I don't necessarily think that it needs to be a change in in that, you know, language, but more so um, moving towards additional language, right? Because I know that we still use radical hospitality, right? We use inclusive excellence. But one of the things when we talk about words and as we're on the, the language piece of things, um, a lot of things have become a buzzword, right? And, and I just call it out for what it is. It's like, you know, we say diversity, we say safe space, we say inclusive excellence, we say radical hospitality, and we say all these things. And it's like, what does it mean? Like, what are we actually saying? So I think when we use these words, it really is, it depends on what exactly we're looking, you know, what, what's our goal? What are we looking to do um, as we're using this language? When we say inclusive excellence, what are we actually doing? What are we using it to promote, right? Because if we're saying inclusive excellence and what we really are promoting is, you know, anti-racism, then we need to say anti-racism, right? So we have to think back to what is our mission, what is our goal, and how are we executing that, but how are we also using the appropriate language to do just that, right? Um, and with that, I'm just gonna kind of go, I'm probably gonna go off just a little bit. Um, but when we talk about even the, the term BIPOC, right? We talk about, or people of color. Um, when it comes to representation, when it comes to identity, when it comes to language, um, you know, some people identify me as a woman of color, which yes, that's true, but I'm a black woman. Right? And sometimes when we use certain language, it, it's to remove identities or to not call it out for what it is, for whatever reason that may be. And we have to get comfortable with saying this is where we are and this is where we stand. Because a lot of times, and, and how I call it, for lack of a better term, is really a cop out. Right, We're saying certain things because we don't want to say that other thing. So it kind of leaves us in a, a comfortable area. And we really have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. We really, Anti-racist work is a lot of work. It's mentally exhausting, it's emotionally exhausting, it is draining, but we have to do the work. But going back again to language, we, we have to you know not just use language that's comfortable, not just language that, as Paul said, sounds good, right? Inclusive excellence sounds great, but think back to what it is that is our mission, what it is that we are aiming to do, and use the language that is appropriate for such. Um. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think thinking about this question historically, um, not just in terms of this institution, I mean, I think um, most institutions in the 21st century want to appear anti-racist, and so um, they 
they are going to use catch words that are familiar to most folks. Um, and, you know, these things have a history. And again, you know, I'm a historian. You know, in the past, we might have used diversity or multiculturalism or integration, um, assimilation. There's been all kinds of words to get at these questions. Um, from a social movement perspective, um, and here I'm thinking about, uh, you know, black social movements in the 60s and 70s. I mean, they were less interested in integration and inclusivity, and they were more interested in transformation, right? Um, so even if we were to read someone like Martin Luther King Jr., you know, he was interest, interested in transformation. And so for me, regardless of what the word is, the question is, what are the actual goals and outcomes and actions? I think that, that gets back to what you were talking about before. Um, you know, what are the commitments of the Board of Trustees and those kinds of things? How can we tie language to actual um, institutions or programs here and solutions that ought to be measured to determine if those things are fulfilled, et cetera, right? You know, real things, right, um, that we expect of any institution. Um, I don't think Fairfield should be any different. All right, we've softened you up, we've warmed you up. Come on, ask a question. Someone must be wondering about something other than what's for dinner. Yes, thank you. So you were talking about using language as a means of more fully addressing what actions need to be taken and what, like, progress we can make going forward. Mm -hmm. But um, I would kind of say like we need to acknowledge that before progressive actions can be taken and like real steps can be taken with the action or with the language that we're using um, with the most efficacy. Uh, don't you think we need to first step back and address um, and weed out the flaws with the system and the inst institution itself? Like you were talking about the um, um, the policies that need to be taken out, like, wouldn't you say it's more so important to emphasize that effort rather than trying to create new languages and more fully describe ways that we can go moving forward? Um, my response to this is, is easy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we have to. I mean, that was in response to language is important, right? Like, just what we say and, and how we say it and making sure that it lines up. But Absolutely, we first need to look at what those policies are, and we need to dismantle the systems um, that contribute and or are explicitly racist at the end of the day. Um, and sometimes that, to your point, um, it can actually influence the language that we're using, right? Because you're, you're looking at, well, what are we looking to do? So in the, same, in the same respect, it's like we're making sure that the language lines up with the goals and, and the mission and what we're looking to do. But even before that, we have to think of, um, what the mission is and what we're aiming to do, right? Um, and even finding a word or, or a topic or whatever the case may be to make sure that it's suitable for such. But it's less about what the language is in that respect um, and more about obviously the action steps and the work that we're doing and, and again, dismantling systems and, and you know, re looking at policies. Um, and also with policy, I'll also just say that it's important to look at where the world is. We know that the world is changing and evolving and just, you know, looking at who's in the room um, when we're making these policies, right? Because um, I think it's fair to say that some policies that are still in place that have been in place for X number of years is not reflective of the people that it's looking to serve today, right? So we have to look at who's in the room today, who are we serving? When we talk about serving the underserved, we have to think about who it is that we're serving. Who are we serving, right? Un the underserved population is massive, it's expansive, but we have to think through, okay, this is the group that we're serving. Again, who is in the room? And also, when we talk about decision makers, who is not in the room? Uh, Tushi earlier was talking about representation. Who's not in the room when we're making these decisions? Whose voice is not being amplified when, when we're having these conversations, right? We talked about senior leadership being largely white men, right? There's tons of underserved folks that are not in that room, even though there might be 
you know, one or two people from different areas or from underserved identities. But again, that in of itself is difficult because it's like, you know, you feel that you're carrying that entire community on your back and being the spokesperson for that, you know, individual um, community. But to answer your question, absolutely. Someone else? Yeah. I have to read it, but um, pertaining to the progression of internalized training, um, do you believe that a Title VI report should be filed overruling a victim of racist remarks wishes not, um, even if they wish not to? So when someone reports to like an RA or a mandated reporter in confidence, do you think that the mandated reporter should file a Title VI over the, overruling? Um, the victim of racist remarks wishes. Yeah, whenever you want me to answer this, is this is this directed to me or is it directed? No, to it's directed to anyone. Okay. That's, isn't that a legal question? Yeah. <laughs> it's a question about confidentiality, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, sorry, can you, can you connect the dots a little bit better? So, the title six is when you report, so right. if someone reports to the mandated reporter, mm -hmm. and then the mandated reporter reports to the RA, or the mandated and how is the training part connected to that? Just like how someone would handle that. Ah. Like that. So you mean sort of, sort of um, the kind of training that the reporter would receive or the student right. in terms of, oops, sorry. Yeah, that's a legal question. I mean, I, I think it's difficult. What I will say about that, um, and this is not answering your question, unfortunately, but just sort of getting at the spirit of it. Um, which is about confidentiality and safety, right? I think that's the nature of the question. Um, you know, I think it's really important and there are potential consequences. Um, in a different frame, we might call that person a whistleblower, right? Um, and, you know, I think that's a, a personal choice. Um, it would be great if institutions created resources and um, um, institutions that could pre protect students and others, faculty, staff, in a way to report those kinds of instances so they don't, they don't feel unsafe. Um, I mean, the, it, just to pull back, this is why I focus on institutions, right? Um, because oftentimes, um, institutions can continue to engage in racist practices partly because um, or sexist practices, partly because folks are afraid to report um, these kinds of things. Um, and sometimes um, news institutions may be more committed to the story and less committed to the safety. I mean, I think it's a really complicated situation. That doesn't exactly answer your question, but I appreciate the question because it's a really important one. Um. To add to that, it's also, as an RA, like that is a very much of a legal question. But that also calls to the point of what are safe spaces that we do have? What are those resources that we can have on campus if they are limited? Like how do we expand those opportunities to have that? I would add, um, as we're saying, it's, it's a legal question. Um, that makes me think about, again, policy, mm -hmm. right? If it's a legal question, it's, it's the system that is in place. So we have to think through those systems, essentially. Um, and if, there, if there's an opportunity for, you know, anonymity, um, potentially, right, to say that this is happening, and I think for just univer the university to, to know that this is going on, right, the person may say, you know, I'm not going to say that, you know, Bob told me that this is happening, you know, to him, again, to not to protect the individual, 
Um, but to know, I think that it's important for the university to know that this is a real thing and this is going on here on this campus. And regardless of who it happened to, understanding that it happened to a student, um, to anyone on campus in, in the campus community, then something needs to happen, right? Um, and even focusing in that regard on the, the larger community versus the individual, because I, I believe that there's a reason as to why that individual, you know, wanted to either be anonymous or not wanting, you know, to share that, right? But still needing, like Tucci mentioned, like that safe space. Um, but more, I guess, closer to answer your question without answering your question, right, um, mm -hmm. is talking about um, policies in place and, and how we rethink those things, right? Because if we ever have to say, ah, oh, that's a tough one, like that's a legal question or like, you know, and it's kind of between a rock and a hard place, the policy is the thing that is, is the rock and the hard place that we have to figure out um, how we're navigating that. Of course, the policy has to follow the law, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, well, laws and policy, like law, policy, I mean, hand in hand, when we talk about law, I mean, slavery was legal, right? So when we talk about what's legal and legal questions and we talk about the law, they all go hand in hand um, as well. So a couple of you raised good questions. We have a third one here. Come on, somebody's burning to ask. Um, so this came up uh, because of something Dr. King said, but for all of you, um, I was talking to a colleague about this today. White folks really like to be forgiven. Right? We, we like to... Sir, I said, uh, white folks really like to be forgiven. We like to rush to forgiveness. And Dr. King mentioned... Um, economic reparations, that apologizing can repair harm in legislation. And often when people apologize, they think they've been forgiven. Can you share about where forgiveness plays or does not play a part in the reparation process? Thank you. So I was stating that's one form. Um, <laughs> you know, I think forgiveness is important. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the model is South Africa and reconciliation, right? Um, I do think, though, um, that that can be a little too easy um, because part of what I think a lot of us are saying um, is that these issues aren't the past, they're the present, right? And what that means is that um, we are, we continue to be injured in ways that are less visible because um, it appears that laws have made us first class citizens, right? Um, so just to give a quick example, um, we might talk about the Great Recession and the subprime loans which targeted black and brown working class people Right, um, and that's in most of our lifetime, um, but most folks don't recognize that as an example of um, institutionalized racism. Um, another re related example could be, but different, um, is how you know this country um, gives all kinds of tax opportunities for, for institutions and businesses and enterprises. Um, one way to describe that would be welfare. Um, but when conversations around reparations come up, it often becomes easy for some to either ignore or to um, view these issues as simply um, a handout, right? Um, with that said, I do think an apology and forgiveness is a first step. I also think that it's something that has to be a process. And from a sort of social justice approach, um, it would include the injured, right? And it would be about the injured um, feeling as if um, their grievances acknowledged, right? I mean, there are various ways and approaches that that happens, um, which requires more than a few words of apology, right? And, you know, I, I think that 
you know, part of it goes back to, um, and you know, um, I don't think you guys needed me. I think we could just listen to Tushi and Yalima, but Yalima um, mentioned training. I mean, there are people who know how to do these things and can provide resources um, strategies and practices for all of the for a lot of these things, um, and these could be things that our institution invests in, in addition to a chief diversity equity inclusion officer. I echo that, um, but if I can also just add something that I say is um, that can be a first step, but the best apology is change behavior, right? So we actually have to do the work, and by change behavior, I mean doing the work. Um, by change behavior, I don't just mean that, like, you were doing something wrong, but it's part of doing the work to be anti-racist, right? Not to say, like, oh, my God, I'm just so sorry that that happened to you, and, like, just apologizing. And then, again, recognizing why you're doing what you're doing. Is it to bear the weight off of your shoulders to feel like, oh, I feel like I did something. I feel like I contributed because I apologized. I acknowledge that. But what else did you do? Right? It, it's, it's actively doing the work in that apology. It's kind of that idea of show, don't tell. Right, like I'm, I'm sorry that this happened, and we're in, we're in the current now, or this is happening, right? Because as we recognize and acknowledge today, um, that it still happens, right? So what are we doing about that? It's, it's really to be an agent of change in this environment through that apology, because there's different ways to apologize, right? Some people just say. I'm sorry, but some people actually show it through actions and doing certain things and advocating and, and learning how to be allies and so on and so forth. So what does your apology look like? And I think that's really what people have to come to terms with um, is what that apology looks like, even in those beginning stages, right? Um, so that's what, that's what I'll add. I'll add to what both of you said, but I strongly believe, and to put it concisely, forgiveness begins with yourself. And I don't just mean like, okay, I did that and like that's what happened, but forgiveness in the sense of why did that happen? Challenging yourself in the sense of we are a Jesuit institution, mm -hmm. spirituality and self-reflection values that we stand by. Reflecting upon that, genuinely questioning yourself, why did that happen? What caused it? What are those unconscious and subconscious biases that exist in my life? And how can I change that into action? And I think that's where the action lies. It starts with yourself and recognizing that. So uh, we have a, a, a question from the online group uh, from uh, Biagio Mazza, and it's a bit like the question I was going to ask, so I'm going to put them both together, and it follows up on the reparations issue. So Biagio's question is this, how do you dialogue with others who see no need for reparations since they were not perpetrators like their ancestors and thus do not feel responsible for what happened in the past. And the question I was going to ask, which is somewhat similar to that, was, well, why does it matter to Fairfield? Fairfield was founded long after slavery. We, we weren't, we're not like Georgetown. We don't live off the inheritance of selling slaves. So um, just to, some of what I said, and I don't know if I said it too quickly, um, some of the policies, um, government policies that I mentioned were post-slavery. Um, uh, as I said, the 18, well not post-slavery, 1862 Homestead Act, um, the Southern Homestead Act, the New Deal programs, um, Part of, the, part of what's important about those various political uh, actions is that they're wealth um, garnering. Um, so that's purchasing land, it's passing down wealth, um, it means equity, right? So part of the reason why um, I identified those particular policies is that the way we tend to gain wealth, part, it, part of it is salary, but part of it is passing down assets to your children and grandchildren. And so if you had access to those different policies, and therefore, um, although you may not have been alive, or maybe your grandparent had access to the Federal Housing Administration loan, it is very likely that um, you are benefiting from that wealth. Um, part of what we know is that um, a lot of the 
wealth disparities between blacks and whites is precisely because of that moment between 1934 and 1968, and that folks are, uh, have benefited from that. Um, so that's one way of thinking about it. Um, another, another way um, beyond, you know, beyond the, the sort of economic and political way is that if you're committed to these issues, right, um, and if you believe that there is wrongdoing, then I, I do think it's important for one to um, get involved through action um, around these questions. Um, that's partly why when I gave the example uh, between Georgetown and Fairfield, I mean, part of it was getting at, um, you know, the historic differences, but how reparations could look different depending upon the institutions. It's similar to the gentleman's question um, around studying, right? Um, so I don't know, and I, you know, I don't know if we have any um, Connecticut and Fairfield University or Fairfield County experts, um, but I'm pretty sure there are various ways to think through and discuss um, our county's history regarding Native Americans, African Americans, and others. Um, and if we are truly committed to these issues, we could certainly play a part in doing that research and being committed to actions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, you know, I'm not necessarily um, an advocate uh, of the, of the, of limiting these conversations to slavery, um, because I do think they're ongoing. Um, so, you know, just in a, in a simple way, as I said, in terms of um, the comparison that I made between um, sort of how businesses profit from our taxes and that a lot of us don't realize that we're supporting these big businesses that are incredibly wealthy and exploitative, such as Amazon, for example. Um, um, I do think that we could also use our tax monies for something where we can agree that there was some form of wrongdoing. I think we, uh, I don't know if you were referring to this, but you know, we do have a Fairfield slavery project yes. that was, which certainly showed that slavery is not something that only existed down south. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, you haven't been very talkative, except for a couple of very brave people, thank you both, but you have been attentive or at least quiet. So thank you very much for being here. Can you join me in a round of applause for our panel? And if you want to come to another event and not ask a question, uh, <laughs> tomorrow evening at 7.30 in the event space at the School of Business is the annual Jewish Christian Engagement Lecture. It will be a lot of fun. See you there. <laughs>